Stephen King is one of the most prolific horror writers of all time. His works that have been translated to media are so varied that not only are King films a sub-genre, we can also deep dive further. You have theatrical movies, basic cable movies, premium shell movies, limited and full series movies. It's been happening so long that the movies based on his books are even receiving remakes. Hell, even the miniseries are getting remakes. Then there's a category of one. The one movie the master of horror directed himself, Maximum Overdrive. When going through his vast collection of adaptations, you can make the case for a handful of different films to be crowned a black sheep. However, a lot of what you'd think should be a good candidate is, is just bad. Now, hey, a bad movie is fine. A bad movie is personality. But today's selection is so damn fun, I've been dumbfounded on why it's hated as much as it is. Which brings me to the cocaine-fueled Maximum Overdrive, the one true king black sheep. Now this one gets lost in the shuffle for multiple reasons, but has quite a bit going for it. Uh, the cast, I got eggs on. the wacky story, oh. <laughs> and especially the soundtrack. Give this film a special something that has been lost to both time and honestly, a lot of shit talking. By 1986, we had already been treated to several Stephen King adaptations. Bonafide classics like Carrie and The Shining. Then some thoroughly enjoyable flicks like Firestarter and Salem's Lot. His movies have been tackled by legends themselves. De Palma, Carpenter, Hooper, Romero, Kubrick. While King has done screenplays before in adapting his work, he had never stepped behind the camera to tackle directing duties on one of these projects. Maximum Overdrive is based on a short story, Trucks, from his Night Shift collection, published in 1978. While the basic premise is the same, Machines apparently operating by themselves or under the direction of some agency we don't understand. The film version deviated heavily in terms of tone and cast of characters, almost certainly to indulge in the needed staples of 80s horror, including body count and special effects. The movie begins with a comet passing near enough to Earth that its tail causes machines all over the world to rebel and start acting funny. And this starts with simple things like an ATM insulting the master of horror himself. This machine just called me an asshole. Or a bridge opening and its lights malfunctioning to cause issues, but quickly devolves into a machine murder. Here's the first real difference. The short story really only discusses the trucks as the villains with a heavy machine here and there, and a reference to perhaps even planes. But in the movie, we have everything from a homicidal pop machine to a killer pinball table, in addition to big rig baddies. The leader of the trucks has a creepy clown on the back, and a totally not copyright infringing Green Goblin, whose eyes light up a deep red when he's about to start some trouble. The cast gets put together inside a gas station, and man, this is quite the strange group of character actors. Yet anchoring this group, is Emilio Estevez as our star, right in the middle of his Brat Pack fame. Yo. Mm -hmm. This cast list, Estevez aside, is as confusing in 1986 as it is in 2021. Anyone already at the gas station slash diner are quickly joined by the trucker characters, newlyweds. Don't make me a widow on my wedding day, Curtis. And our hitchhiking love interest, you come back here, girl. Brett, played by Laura Harrington when they figure out that things are not normal, when all the machinery begins to act out. They blind one person, try to cut the hand off another, and electrocute a third. At the same time, in what feels like another movie, we follow a young man as he witnesses the mechanical carnage firsthand in much more graphic ways. He even has one of the creepier scenes in the movie where he comes to a neighborhood ravaged by lawnmowers, car windows, and even Walkman headphones. At a quiet street corner, the camera pans to the end of the street, where an ice cream truck jingle breaks the silence as the driverless treats vehicle passes, looking for victims. I mean, how, how can you not like that? It's surprisingly good stuff in an otherwise fairly silly film. After finally figuring out what is going on, well, about as well as you could in this situation, our group decides they need to get out. Well, I got a plan. 
The trucks want them to feel the current residents as well as all their buddies they can contact, even bring in a mounted machine gun turret to keep our humans honest. With musings about why all this is happening and out of nowhere subplot about the station owner Bubba being a redneck amateur gun runner, I'm warning you. the movie finally gets to its end game. After what is easily the most over-the-top performance in a slew of over-the-top performances. Didn't you understand? Wanna know? You can't do this! We made you! <laughs> From our diner waitress who has just had it, and the deaths of some of the other major players, the remaining crew finds their way to the docks Adios, motherfucker! Where they decide to ride the rest of this mess out in the open sea where, you know, trucks aren't really prevalent. And a move that would make Poochie from The Simpsons blush, our ending is presented merely with a title card. A UFO is nuked by a Russian satellite, and six days later, the Earth has moved out of the comet's tail. That's it. Though it does give some credence to Emilio Estevez pondering that this was caused by an alien race to come clean us out before they could claim our planet. You're looking for a new place to live. Here in stellar house cleaners. Send in their room. This does differ from the short story where it ends with the main characters still fueling up the trucks, wondering what else is affected worldwide. So, what happened here? This movie is easily one of the most entertaining things we have defended on this show. And it has a ton going for it. It has everything a Stephen King property should carry. With bullies, mostly unexplained supernatural or science fiction phenomenon, and some gnarly set pieces. And a movie that is quite different from a lot of his books and their movie counterparts, this one actually ends okay for the majority of our heroes. It's silly, which I think is the biggest problem. People wanted horror, they want to be scared. But if you're not going to scare me, at least entertain me, and this is what Maximal Overdrive does. The actors seem to be having fun for the most part, and it takes advantage of having a cast that mixes classic character actors, like Pat Hingle as Bubba, who, for some amazing reason, calls everyone else in the movie Bubba. He did right, Bubba. Found it in my Christmas stocking, Bubba. <laughs> Get inside. <laughs> Never change, sir. Never change. And Frankie Faison giving us a more anchored and likable character, as well as a very in-demand young actor like Emilio Estevez. King was able to convince ACDC to put together the music for the film. Now, a lot of its songs are from existing albums like, you know, You Shook Me All Night Long, Hell's Bells, or Those About to Rock. And that's fine, as you can take any great existing music and add it to a film to get some magic. I mean, Martin Scorsese has made a career out of adding great rock songs to all of his movies. The one new track that ACDC wrote and performed for this movie, Who Made Who, is catchy, rocking, and as iconic as anything else you would find on the album. I mean, if anything, we should thank Maxim Overdrive for giving us one of the true, badass songs of the 80s. The other weirdly fun thing, and something that probably hurt the movie more than it helped, is a crazy promo where a coked-out king introduces himself discusses the movie and claims that he wanted to see his work done right while promising to scare the hell out of you. The trailer is in fact scarier than anything in the film and doesn't do a good job of telling the audience what they are in for. Now, why is this movie hated or completely lost in the shuffle when discussing King movies? Part of it, as King himself says, is that he was coked out of his mind during the entire production and the experience made him never want to direct again. Another aspect is that it was released in July. It came out just two weeks after Aliens, and that was going to cannibalize anything, let alone a horror tale with an identity crisis. Finally, 1986 was not the year for genre films. You had Karate Kid 2, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and of course, Top Gun. These were the things people were actively looking for. Other than Poltergeist 2, and the sixth installment of the Friday the 13th series, personal favorite, there wasn't a lot of reason for cinema goers to get excited about horror. I mean, we've got The Fly and Big Trouble in Little China, but, but those wouldn't get their love until way after their release. The film only grossed around $7 million on a $9 million budget. Between this and the underrated King Kong Lives, which, you know how I feel about the big guy, 1986 just may be the year of the Black Sheep. Whether you are new to Maximum Overdrive or it has just been a while, turn up the volume, turn off your brain, and have some fun with Stephen King.
Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.